I'm Klaus Rien. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Statesmanship, CSS, at Catholic <laughs> University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a luncheon program on this, the 50th, 15th anniversary of Mission Accomplished. Um, that is the, the mission accomplished in question was, of course, the Iraq War. Now, while you settle down and uh, get something to eat, we'll play you a video to introduce you to CSS. I've told the American people before that this will not be another Vietnam. America's security has depended on the clarity of this message. Don't tread on us. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, yet our purpose is sure. The United States did not seek this fight. It's harder to end wars than it is to begin them. The principal result of recent U.S. wars has been to create instability and upheaval. And we've paid a heavy cost for that. We have killed many tens of thousands of people. Massive refugee problems. It has exacerbated the terrorism problem for the Iraq war alone. The total cost is five to six trillion dollars. Sadly, the American people have come to accept war as normal. We have our military power still, and we are using it to preserve and defend a crumbling status quo, using it to try to retain prestige, which we have lost in other spheres. Not only is there no strategy with regard to how to bring our wars to a successful conclusion, but there really is no large view how the world works, where it's headed, and what part the United States might play. The need for restraint has been recognized for a very, very long time. The framers of the U.S. Constitution were almost obsessed with the need to control power, to decentralize power. That moral and cultural foundation has eroded. People have come up with new, beautiful-sounding arguments for why the United States ought to be deeply involved in all corners of the Earth. The armed global hegemon. People die on a large scale as a result of dubious, unexamined assumptions. That's why the constitutional temperament is so needed to restrain people, to make them step back from reckless conduct. Nowhere is the need for statesmanship greater than in foreign policy. Here at the Center for the Study of Statesmanship at, at Catholic University, we want to take a new approach to offer big ideas that revolve around restraint rooted in a deep, moral, ethical, constitutional tradition. The Center for the Study of Statesmanship will go upstream from public policy debates. And by looking at the assumptions undergirding the foreign policy thinking, it will be possible critically to examine the sources of this sort of thinking. The question of how the world's most powerful country acts on the global stage and what its actions mean for others as well as for Americans is one that badly needs addressing. There are many sort of programmatic activities we will have here at the center. Scholarships and fellowships for PhD students, seminars, testimony, op-ed pieces, visiting professors who come and speak to policymakers. We're hoping to ferment an entire intellectual movement. One of the things we're most excited about at the center is the potential to partner with some of the military academies on a symposium every year provoke some ideas and thoughts, and maybe give a rebirth to that skepticism in the officer corps culture about American interventionism. We need to educate Americans, stimulate Americans, pay attention to what's being done to our country, in many respects what's being done to the world. We need this center 
we're hoping to spark a conversation around the country. So it's been 15 years since President George W. Bush declared mission accomplished. Some of you remember his standing on the deck of a U.S. naval carrier. Time has gone by and the Iraq war still has not ended. And it looks at times as if the U.S. might be inclined into further wars. Iran, Syria come to mind. Uh, President Trump's foreign policy team, as it has evolved, seems to have an, a decidedly interventionist tilt. I don't need to mention any names, I believe. Now, on this anniversary of Mission Accomplished, one has to ask the question whether we have learned any lessons from the Iraq experience. And we are very fortunate to have, to be able to ask that question of two persons with exceptional qualifications. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson is the former Chief of Staff uh, to Secretary of State Colin Powell. He served as Powell's right-hand man also when Powell was Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. As Secretary Powell's Chief of Staff at State, Colonel Wilkerson found himself right in the middle of the big push to attack Iraq. And he has thought deeply about how the war came about and the meaning of the war. Today, he is Distinguished Adjunct Professor of Government at William and & Mary and Senior Visiting Fellow at CSS. Ambassador Chess Freeman is a legendary diplomat, a national security expert with a remarkable breadth of experience. Early in his career, he was with President Nixon in China as his principal interpreter. Many years later, he served as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia. He held that post during both Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He's a former Assistant Secretary of Defense. He's a senior fellow at Brown University's Watson Institution for International and Public Affairs. Both men will speak for approximately 10 minutes, giving their reflections on this anniversary. And Lawrence Wilkerson will be first at the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're going to speak from here. OK. Or if you prefer to sit there, fine. Uh, I was just thinking, as you were saying that, uh, Professor, that uh, the man sitting to my right here is as much an edifice of this town as the buildings I traversed coming here, <laughs> the marble and the concrete. I, I feel honored to be here with you. I want to focus on one particular example of what the little short film clip demonstrated comprehensively in the shortness that it, it had. It still talked about this problem we have, this problem called war, constant war. Um, from a perspective of a professional soldier, if I were still in the Army today, I would, or the Marine Corps, or the Navy, or the Air Force, I would be really questioning my Commander-in-Chief and my country, as many of my veterans on the campus of William & Mary do with me every day. I'm their faculty advisor, and I hear from them generally every day I'm on campus. But the specific instance I want to talk about right now is what Powell and I talked about in his office as we approached the Iraq war and he came in one day and he said to me, get me everything, everything that was written on Vietnam. I want to take it to the White House. Get me everything that was written on mission accomplished in Iraq. I want to take it to the White House. I want to take it to the American people. You may have seen an op-ed I wrote in the New York Times a little over a month ago. We are doing the same thing again. And it is so similar that one has to wonder at the <coughs> perception of the people in this country to include their representatives in this august body whose building we sit in today. We are headed for another one, and we're headed for it in much the same method that we did in 2002 and 2003. Last night, was a vivid demonstration of that 
as the Prime Minister of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu, resurrected information that was so old it was dripping with dirt and presented it as if it were fresh stuff, accusing Iran of things that our intelligence community has already commented on, commented on it greatly, and then subsequently commented on that Iran had turned away from that path and in all practical ways, probably with 97 or 98 percent surety today, we know is in compliance with the nuclear agreement which we negotiated with them, along with, I might add, other members of the permanent, permanent members of the Security Council, Germany, Russia, and China, and a host of others, Europe really too, represented by the EU. This reminded me vividly of what I helped Secretary Powell do at the United Nations on February the 5th, 2003. Essentially connect, because the most powerful part of that presentation was, Iraq with Al-Qaeda. And in the minds of the American people, that pushed another 10 or 11 percent of them and pushed them well over 50 percent in support of that war. Because we lied. And we didn't lie willingly, we didn't lie wittingly even. We were led to those lies by a very careful orchestration of intelligence that is being repeated right now by Nikki Haley at the United Nations, by Bibi Netanyahu and Avigdor Lieberman, who just addressed the Jerusalem Post Conference in New York with a speech entitled The Coming War with Iran. Israel and everything Israel represents strategically right now wants the chaos that's in the Gulf region. Because as long as the Arabs are fighting each other and the Persians are in the middle, they can't consolidate and fight Israel. I understand that strategic approach. As a military professional, I understand that approach. Indeed, your country, my country, used it for almost eight years of the most brutal war in the region. We took both sides, Iraq and Iran. And from time to time, we were taking both sides simultaneously. And then finally, in Operations Earnest Will, reflagging Kuwaiti tankers and Operation Praying Manus, where we actually sunk an Iranian warship and destroyed their command and control facilities, we decided to take Iraq's side. The saying in the Pentagon at that time was, let's let them fight until there's one Arab and one Persian left, and then we'll issue dueling pistols. That's Israel's strategy right now. But we do not need to be a part of that strategy if it means dragging the United States into another ground war in Southwest Asia. I guarantee you, guarantee you, come get me afterwards and talk to me if I'm not dead. It will be far worse than Iraq in terms of treasure and blood. We will have to put eventually a conscripted force on the ground to make sure that we do root out every aspect of a nuclear program that we say is there. And every one of those GIs, every man and woman of, uh, amongst them will have a red bullseye on their back for every terrorist in the region who will flock there. You won't need to look for ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, Jamaa Zlamiya, Lashkar-e Taiba, or anybody else. They'll all be there killing Americans. <coughs> It will be sport. We do not need to put massive U.S. military force on the ground in Southwest Asia, and yet it looks as if we're going there again, and this time, I have to admit, the time before, we had one of the most accomplished bureaucratic entrepreneurs and manipulator of the federal system I have ever seen in my 40 years of service, Richard Cheney. Today, we have a team of rank amateurs that changes seats, important seats, routinely. So my concern is deepened profoundly by the fact that we are confronting a situation not unlike the one we did with Mission Accomplished 15 years ago, but we're confronting it with a group of rank amateurs. And I, I don't include necessarily the Secretary of Defense in that, but I do in the sense that I don't think he can stand up to these people much longer. So what is my uh, canary in the coal mine? When Jim Mattis leaves, then I'm going to get really worried, really worried, because then the sane and sober people will be no more. 
I don't think John Kelly is for much longer. It's a disaster waiting to happen. And if we don't do something, if we don't take action, we're going to be regretting it for a long time to come. Much more so, I think, than most of us regret Iraq. The reason I say that <clears throat> to the extent that I do is I don't think we get out of this one. I think we stay there and stay there and stay there and stay there. And that's the best way in the world, <coughs> history tells me, without too much doubt, to fritter away the power of empire in waste, ruin, and destruction. Not only ours, but thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of other people. This is not the way to conduct great power diplomacy, great power power, period. It's not the way to, to conduct foreign and security policy. I watched one thing happen that was positive in this regard with the Obama administration. And I, I don't have a lot of praise for Hillary Clinton, for John Kerry, I spent an hour in the Roosevelt Room listening to President Obama tell me how hard it was to manage the war <laughs> impulse in Washington. His exact words were, quote, there's a bias in this town toward war, unquote, and looking at him and thinking, it took you seven years to figure that out, Mr. President. <coughs> but the thing that really concerned me about that conversation and about everything that went into it was what I'm saying here today. He at least recognized that the problem was serious. He and John Kerry both recognized that the problem was serious. <coughs> Kerry less so than Obama because Kerry had not seen at that point what had happened with regard to this body, the legislative body, and the White House. Kerry had wanted, you might recall, to put major U.S. ground forces on the, uh, on the ground in Syria. President Obama had been conflicted over that. And what had happened in both this branch of government and in the executive branch is that, as one person in both places put it to me, almost in the same words, the cards and letters and emails and constituent visits just rose off the chart. People, I, you probably know that better than I, people came and said, you, know, you shouldn't do this. Americans from all over the country said to the White House and to the legislature, you shouldn't do this. Call it war weariness, call it some kind of intellectual realization of what we're talking about here today, call it what you will, but the American people, and this was testified to by the President and with some reluctance by the Secretary of State, the American people stopped that. If we don't have something like that soon, either from their representatives or from the people, and preferably from both, this country is in serious trouble. Thank you. <clears throat> Ambassador Freeman. <coughs> um, in the course of 30 years of service as a diplomat, I learned that colonels know how to lead. <laughs> and I'm going to take my instructions from the colonel and uh, not go to the podium, and I'm strengthened in that decision by remembering a conversation a friend of mine had with uh, Linus Pauling, who you probably remember earned two Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry and one for peace. And Linus Pauling was in his 90s, and my friend asked him what the secret of long life was, expecting to hear something about vitamin C. Um, and Dr. Pauling replied, never let go of the handrail. Uh, there isn't one, so I'm going to stay here. Um, Fifteen years ago today, speaking in Kabul, Secretary of Defense Donald uh, Rumsfeld declared that in Afghanistan, and I quote, we have clearly moved from major combat activity to a period of stability and stabilization and reconstruction activities, unquote. Later that same day, standing on the flight deck of the USS Abraham Lincoln, President George W. Bush proclaimed that, quote, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed, unquote. He described the U.S. overthrow of the Iraqi government as, quote, one victory in a war on terror that began on September the, the 11th, 
2001, adding that, quote, our war on terror is not over, yet it is not endless, unquote. But evidently, it is indeed endless. Secretary Rumsfeld defined success in this war as not creating more terrorists than we kill. That seems a fair standard. But by this criterion, what we've done is clearly counterproductive. In 2003, we invaded Iraq to prevent weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist from falling into the hands of terrorists who also didn't exist until our arrival and subsequent misconduct begat them. In 2003, we were engaged in military operations in two West Asian nations, Afghanistan and Iraq. In 2018, the Cost of War Project at Brown Swatson Institute for International and Public Affairs documents American involvement in some level of combat in 76 nations. For at least the past 15 years, we have been creating more terrorists than we kill. Anti-American terrorists with global reach and homegrown terrorists alike explain they're over here because we're over there. Our political leaders keep saying they can't possibly have that right. Surely they hate us because of who we are, not what we've done and where. But the kith and kin of the roughly four million Muslims we have been responsible for killing in the post-Cold War era say otherwise. We cannot erase past errors, but we can and we should learn from them. Yet we do not seem to be doing so. Instead, we continue to repeat our blunders. Sometimes the cause is hubris. We should have learned by now that every cakewalk does not put cake on your plate. Sometimes the cause is doctrinal delusion. When they encounter a reality, some of the most popular axioms of neoconservatism shrivel up and die. <laughs> At least the following six assumptions of interventionism consistently turn out to be false. First, wars in countries with significant natural resources like oil can easily be made to pay for themselves. Second, regime change can transform foreign societies because inside every foreigner there is a liberal de democrat yearning to come out. Third, if you kick the natives hard enough, they will turn into the moral equivalent of Canadians, meek, unfailingly polite, and reconciled to American primacy. Fourth, in addition to the gerbils who inhabit the deserts of the Fertile Crescent, this region is full of Arab moderates, eager to risk their lives by bravely making war on savage Islamist fanatics. Fifth, exiles mean what they say, and say what they mean. And sixth, if we sock it to them, those would-be terrorists over there, they won't dare follow us home. The cost of the experience that has refuted these absurdities has been considerable. It starts with a lot of dead and maimed soldiers and mercenaries, as well as nearly $7 trillion in outlays and unfunded liabilities to be met by future taxpayers. The dead and wounded come home. The money will never return. It was poured into the sands of West Asia and North Africa or ripped off by contractors. The fact that it was not invested in the general welfare and domestic tranquility of the United States accounts for our broken roads and rickety bridges, the educational malnutrition of our youth, the emerging class divisions in our society, and our reduced international competitiveness. We've just compounded the costs of the warfare state by cutting taxes. This lowers our national savings rate to something below zero and stimulates consumption, adding to our trade and balance of payments deficits. But it also leaves all of our past, present, and future military spending, the defense budget, and related outlays for veterans, nuclear weapons, and propulsion, and so forth, to be funded by borrowing. Over 40% of our mounting liabilities are to foreigners. This morning's paper says 43%. Some of these foreigners we have just designated as adversaries, that is, as candidates to become enemies. Our strategy for paying off our 20 plus trillion dollar debt 
consists of endless credit rollovers. These risk inflation that will push up borrowing costs and advance the inevitable day of financial reckoning for our country. Today, our homeland is shabbier and we are less, not more, secure than we were before we began our rampage through the Muslim world. Placing Russia and China at the top of our roster of enemies and preparing to go to war with them will make our military industrial complex feel better by justifying the procurement of super expensive weaponry, but it will not improve our position in the wars we are currently losing. And it could lead to a devastating nuclear exchange that our country would not survive. We need to make an effort to extract the lessons of our misadventures in West Asia and North Africa so as not to repeat them. Here are a few thoughts on what some of those lessons might be. First, when people in high places twist intelligence to conform to their political convictions, unpleasant surprises and strategic setbacks are almost certain to follow. Second, wars whose objectives cannot be concisely stated are by definition purposeless. They squander rather than validate the sacrifices of the troops we commit to them. Third, if we do something without First asking, and then what? The chances are excellent that we will not like the results. Fourth, starting wars without any idea of how we will end them, on what terms and with whom, is a recipe for endless disaster. Fifth, there are not many problems that can be solved by the ill-considered use of force, but there are almost none that can't be made worse by it. Sixth, Strategies are not the same as campaign plans. Strategies are plans of action designed to achieve defined and desired objectives through the lowest possible investment of effort, resources, and time with the fewest adverse consequences for ourselves. Military campaign, campaign plans should implement strategies, not substitute for them. And seventh, reinforcing failure or doubling down on sunk costs does not repair defective policies. It just extends them and raises the costs of defeat. Sometimes in foreign policy, as in any other business involving investment, the wisest course of action is to cut one's losses and quit on the best terms one can arrange. A final note seems in order. Americans do best when we're true to ourselves. This includes adhering to our Constitution. Recent confirmation hearings in the Senate make me wonder whether our politicians, including some of those with distinguished careers as lawyers, have ever even read the document. In Article 2, Section 2, the Constitution makes the President, quote, Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States, unquote. This empowers the President to respond immediately to attacks on the United States, even before seeking guidance on war aims through a declaration of war from the Congress. But in Article 1, clause, Section 8, Clause 11, the framers of the Constitution very deliberately reserve the power to authorize wars of choice to the Congress alone. All of the many wars that the United States is presently engaged in were presidentially ordained. None, none was expressly or approved by Congress, which has shirked its duty to declare these wars and define their purposes, which is part of crafting sound strategy. That's why you have a national discussion about what you're trying to accomplish with the use of force. This means that all our current wars are extra constitutional. Even the 16 year long war to pacify Afghanistan, as opposed to the initial year-long effort to respond to 9-11 by rooting out Al-Qaeda. And all of these wars began as illegal invasions of foreign sovereignty and breaches of the peace under the UN Charter and international law. As Americans, we can and should do better than this. We need to learn from our mistakes, correct them, return to constitutional practices, and reconsider our policies if our representatives in Congress will not stand up for the basic principles for which our republic was founded, who will? <laughs>
Thank you. Now, am I wrong in hearing that we really have not learned anything from the Iraq experience? Doesn't appear so. Um, and if that is so, considering the enormous costs, financial and human, how could that be? Larry? <laughs> On my final examination that uh, my one student took yesterday morning for three hours, there was a question I posed to her. What are the influences on national security decision making that lead more often to war than the use of any other instrument of national power? She answered that question rather well. She led off with the example of the recent plummet in share price of Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and other defense contractors because of the euphoria on the Korean Peninsula about a possible peace treaty. The second thing she put down, and I think if I'd talked to Logan about it, she would have reprioritized this had she had more time. She'd have put this first. And that is what we've often described in seminar as the predilection to power and the good feeling and the high poles and the genuine sense of doing something that presidents from H.W. Bush to George W. Bush to Donald J. Trump all the way back to the beginning of this country but really powerfully post-World War II get from using military force and the reinforcement they get from the American people at least initially and that goes for this body too. Look at what this body has done in abrogating what Ambassador Freeman just pointed out very carefully and very correctly with regard to the Constitution. This body says, go to war, Mr. President, and if it succeeds, we'll cheer for you. If it fails, we'll rail against you. That's the position of cowards. And yet, that is the position this body has taken ever since Harry Truman decided not even to talk to the Congress for the first two weeks after deciding to oppose the North Korean invasion of South Korea in 1950. And every president since has grabbed a little more power, a little more power, a little more power, until in 1972, after 10 years of the most ridiculous, stupid war, my war, I fought in it, that the U.S. had ever participated in, the Congress decided to reassert its power and it's now Title 50, Chapter 33, Sections 1541 to 48, the so-called War Powers Act or Resolution. And it says explicitly in modern language what the Constitution says in Madisonian language. It says it's this body's responsibility, period. And yet, look at what we have. We have Corker and Cain. Tim Cain, whose son is a Marine, who I know and have talked to at great length about this, essentially not just giving the president a blank check in this Corker Cain bill, but giving him the bank. That's where we are. I don't know how we reverse this. I wish I did. Do you share that view? I do. Um, I think there is a broader issue in the country. I, mean, I agree that uh, we have a, a government that has shirked its responsibilities. An executive that has felt not just empowered uh, to make war, but uh, duty-bound to make war, uh, given the absence of coherent statements coming out of this body and its, its, uh, its sister across the way. Um, but I think there's a broader issue, and that is uh, uh, a, a failure of civic literacy uh, and, and of understanding of statecraft. Let me just briefly explain what I mean. Uh, the citizens, citizens of this country don't know what's in the Constitution, despite the fact that we have civics courses. Uh, even uh, members of Congress and lawyers, as I mentioned, don't appear to understand it. So the first thing is to go back to original documents and understand the basis on which our republic was formed. Second, uh, the United States 
had a very peculiar experience in foreign affairs. We went from isolationism straight into global dominance through the course of World War II with no prior experience in managing uh, international relations. And for 40 some years, we managed alliances uh, very much, very skillfully, uh, becoming more and more militarized as we did that. The Cold War basically pushed a huge amount of money into the academy to study coercive means of getting our way internationally. Nobody put any money into looking at non-coercive means. But in our daily lives, when we want someone to sell us something or uh, to take us somewhere, we don't pull out a gun and demand uh, passage. Uh, so there are lots of things that can be done through diplomacy and other non-violent uh, means that we don't understand. And finally, uh, we have become illiterate, essentially, on the subject of diplomacy. We make no distinction between alliances, which are mutual commitments. Allies have commitments to each other that are broad and general. Entente's, which are limited commitments that are contingent on events. Protectorates, where we're protecting other people for reasons that make strategic sense to us. Client states, where nobody has any obligations, but for one reason or another, we are funneling resources and support into another country. And finally, straight transactional relationships. So everybody is an ally. If you say something nice about the United States, you're an ally and we have a duty to protect you. Nonsense. Uh, we need to reconsider and rediscover uh, the vocabulary of diplomacy, uh, which we never learned because we didn't have to. Yesterday, uh, was it the day before yesterday, I happened to hear President Trump speak about the trillions and trillions that have been spent on the Middle East, and he asked the question, what has it got, gotten us? And he said, absolutely nothing. But as he was reverting to um, uh, form during the election campaign, but then <clears throat> at the same time, he has surrounded himself with a foreign policy team that is tilting decidedly in the direction of interventionism, interventionism hawkishness. Can you shed any light on how, why we would have this particular dynamic? Uh, I was talking to Cardinal Wilkerson in a half humorous way before our program got started and it seems to me rather paradoxical that the only person now available to restrain somebody like John Bolton is Mad Dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I could start off, um, uh, during the campaign, I thought President, uh, the can candidate Trump, uh, said some very sensible things about uh, exercising restraint, not intervening uh, promiscuously abroad, uh, winding up uh, wars that we'd been in too long, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan, and so forth. And that's clearly his instinct, uh, as he had shown in Syria, where he said, you know, we're coming out. Uh, he was immediately refuted by the warfare state. We have built a huge edifice of vested interests in con doing more of the same. Uh, and that is the, what he staffed his administration with. So I don't think it's at all mysterious that uh, a man who I think quite sensibly said, you know, when we got into these uh, protective roles in Europe for Europeans, they were destitute. They'd been bombed, they'd been savaged by war, they were weak, they were unable to do anything for themselves. And it was a good thing that we took, took on the responsibility for holding the line against the Soviet Union. But years ago, decades ago, they regained their strength. They are powerful, they have capabilities, and they don't do their fair share of the work. Because why would they? When we say, well, you should do something, but if you don't, we'll step in and do it for you anyway. Um, and I thought he was very sensible in demanding a reset uh, in U.S. Uh, relationships with allies and with adversaries. But somehow that's been lost. 
And uh, as, was, as you mentioned, Klaus and Larry mentioned, uh, we seem to be making the same push toward an even more foolish war this time than the last, uh, last set of wars uh, were. Uh, and uh, nobody is thinking in the case of Iran, if you get into a war, how are you going to end it? On what terms? What are the consequences of it? consequences of it. So we're making the same mistake. We're not asking, and then what? We have no strategy. We're thinking about the use of force with no clear purpose. That's stupid. Let me reinforce that a little bit, I think, with some anecdotes. Uh, in December of 2000, you may recall, those of you who are old enough to recall, <laughs> that we had a very abbreviated transition period because of the Hung Chan election, the Supreme Court decision, and so forth. Well, Powell and I were the only ones in the transition office on 20 December 2000. Um, and he turned to me and he said, you, you, you write my confirmation testimony. I said, okay, what are we going to say? He said, well, you write it and I'll see if I like it. And so I went out and coordinated with everybody I could get my hands on in the, quote, incoming Bush administration, unquote. Um, what I wrote was, approved by the president-elect himself. It said things like, we want to establish a balance of power that favors freedom, which I found alliteratively attractive. And it said all kinds of things about a humble foreign policy. It said all kinds of things about how this president was going to do things differently. He was going to be a smart, compassionate, but, you know, some steel underneath the velvet, too, president. He got led astray by the same forces that Chaz was just talking about with regard to President Trump, and this president was as inexperienced, believe me, as President Trump, but probably had a lot less inclination to follow the domestic demands of a small base that were necessary for him to titillate himself from time to time. Uh, I'll say George W. Bush was not that sort of person. Donald Trump is. He looks at that domestic coterie that is supporting him, and he has to satisfy that constantly. The German foreign minister was right when he said, this policy on the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement with Iran, is dictated by domestic politics, not by international concerns, security or otherwise. And Macron, Macron from France, said essentially the same thing, if I read the French right. So this president is even more malleable with regard to what might be fundamental views, if he has any, than George W. Bush was. And I saw George W. Bush until he fired Donald Rumsfeld in November 2006 and figured out what Cheney was doing to him and put Cheney in the closet, led around like a bull with a nose in his, or with a ring in his nose, uh, by a very accomplished member of what we call the deep state, the bureaucracy, the warmongering group, whatever we want to call them, the old conservatives were. I think this president is even more subject to that sort of being led around, particularly when he sees that leading as amplifying, augmenting his domestic support. And the neocons have figured that out. They figured it out for George W. They figured it out for DJT. They're back. If there are questions from the floor, this is a good time for them. Yes. Uh I personally think one of the most dangerous things that has developed since 1945, and in particular, and my boss, my boss was really guilty of this, and I aided and abetted him for four years as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and that's the worship of the military. Um, I point out to my students sometimes a picture in Harold Evans' book, The American Century. It's a picture of a shop in Philadelphia. It has a sign in the window. It's a fashionable shop. It says, no dogs, no Jews, and no N-word. 
And then right after it in parentheses, it says, oh, no soldiers do. This is the way we felt about our military for a long time. We kept it out on the prairie at Phil Sheridan's Army of the West fighting Native Americans and so forth. We didn't worship it the way we do today. There are lots of reasons for that, I think. Part of it is assuaging the rest of the country's guilt for having let less than 1% of the country bleed and die for it in war after war after war. But this worship of the military is a very dangerous phenomenon. And one James Madison warned us about eloquently. We have created a class of chicken hawk militarists uh, who have no experience of combat and yet are eager to put other people into it, who don't understand the use of force and its limitations, uh, and whose immediate response to every crisis or challenge is let's go bomb someone. Don't just sit there, uh, bomb someone. Uh, this is in part due to the cult of the warrior and the fact that we treat wars, first of all, they don't happen on our territory. They happen somewhere else and we treat them like video games or sports. And they're reported in exactly the same way. Uh, and we have a, an audience, a stadium full of people cheering the professionals who are banging each other up down there somewhere. Uh, and nobody on our side visibly dies. Uh, so we treat war as a trivial sporting event. And it isn't. And if you have been in a combat zone and seen thousands of dead people, you have a different view. But I recall, and this is a personal anecdote, the end of the war, uh, the Gulf War with Iraq and to liberate Kuwait, um, I went up the so-called road of death from Kuwait to Basra. There were 16,000 pieces of charcoal in human form with white teeth, victims of phosphorus, the retreating Iraqi army. <coughs> they didn't smell because they had completely burned up. Maybe they deserved it. Uh, so I asked Andrea Mitchell, who was then covering the event, what she was going to do with the footage that was being taken. And they didn't put it on because news hour is at dinner hour in the United States. So they didn't show it. So the war was clean. <coughs> Nobody died. Not so. Uh, so we have a mistaken, romanticized, trivial notion of the effects of our uses of force abroad. Other questions? Just a, 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 I gotta add this. My 11 year old grandson, I caught him the other day, he's playing something called Call of Duty. And I said, show me that, Matthew. And he showed it to me. This is what we're doing to our kids. This is one of the highest selling video games in the country right now. And it teaches you how to be a soldier when you're 11. It teaches you how to kill people and be anesthetized to it. It teaches you that when you shoot that guy, two seconds later he's gonna get up and run at you again, you can shoot him again, and so forth. This is what we're doing. And I will tell you right now, the Army leadership knows this. Recruiting is becoming so difficult that the Army actually goes for this kind of video. Now, I don't blame them in a world where their only competitive advantage is that sort of thing. Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit on what you were, were saying. Um, do you think that we took, and you, you all, you distinguished careers and, and, and looked through, that maybe as a country we took, when we took the turn to the all-volunteer force in 1973, I think that the military, or there was this feeling that, well, if it's all-volunteer, it's going to be a restraining influence. Whereas it's turned just the opposite. It seems to have created a Praetorian kind of, 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 of legion force out there. And if one, if we had a, a, a force that was least part of some sort of subscription, which meant that more broader base of society was involved in court. And the second is that in, during Vietnam, Johnson actually raised taxes. And so the all American, the, 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 the whole country felt the cost of the war 
and by 1968 when he put the 10% surcharge on. And George Bush told us all about go shopping in 2002. Uh, if we also were paying for the wars, would that also make a difference rather than borrowing money? Sure, it would, yeah, sure it would make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, Nixon, who came up with the notion of the volunteer force, did that precisely to delink foreign adventures from the American citizen's experience. And that's been very successful. Mm -hmm. And to go back to the idea of sporting events, we have professional teams now, very professional. <clears throat> um, and we don't feel a connection to them the same way you might feel to your son if he's on the football field or the baseball diamond in, in your presence. Um, how many people actually know people who are serving? Um, you know, that's a question. Uh, so uh, that definitely makes it much easier for the president to do uh, what uh, successive presidents have been doing. Uh, so, uh, and second, uh, running wars on credit rollovers is a hell of a <laughs> cheap shot that basically defers all the costs to the next generation. Somebody's got to pay for it. Um, the original notion, and I was part of this in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, was we'd get everybody else to pay for the war. We had something that was called informally Operation Tin Cup. We ran around and asked everybody to pony up. Uh, sometimes the way in which we did it was pretty uh, preposterous. I remember sitting at breakfast with Secretary Baker and uh, the Saudi foreign minister uh, as we were about to go up to Taif in Saudi Arabia to meet the Emir of Kuwait. And the Saudi foreign minister asked uh, Secretary Baker, how much are you going to ask for? And he said, two billion. And, so, and Saud al-Faisal said, no, no, ask for six. So we get up there, and Baker asks for six, and the Kuwaiti finance minister whispers in the ear of the emir, and I understand Arabic, you know, offer two. So he does. He says, that's all I can afford. And then the finance minister had to go out of the room and take a phone call, and the emir agreed to five. And um, nobody would tell the finance minister what had been agreed. So he pursued me in Jidda, and I told him, and he said, oh my God, we're gonna have to dip into our capital. So this is a guy whose whole country had been lost. So anyway, uh, that was the scientific method of assigning responsibility to partners in that, in that war effort. We ended up actually pocketing some money. Uh, that is not a good thing to do to friends or allies. So yes, uh, two principles ought to be there. First, everybody ought to serve or be subject to service. And sep everybody ought to pay, not the next generation. We uh, have a group called the All-Volunteer Force Forum that's been on Kansas, William & Mary, Ohio State last month. We'll be San Angel or Angelo State in Texas, then the Presidio, then Stanford. And we're getting that everywhere we go. But when you ask people, would you support conscription or some form of conscription, if we could make it as fair as possible, overwhelmingly no. So there's a real conundrum there. <laughs> yeah, you recognize the problem and you recognize the difficulty and the challenge morally, ethically, and now even physically. The all volunteer force is bankrupting itself. Yes. Air Force is 2,000 pilots short right now. My son is a drone operator in the Air Force. His squadron is playing, is now running 12 hour shifts with eight hours off, 12 on, eight hours off. The last three hours of every shift, they have to watch them because they go to sleep at the console. Now these are people killing people in Niger and Mali. Um, it's bad in the Army. The Army's not gonna make 80,000 this year unless it takes moral waivers out the yin yang. It's gonna take criminals, it's gonna take uh, drug users and so forth. And if they're honest with you, they'll tell you that. So the force is really in trouble in terms of recruiting, physical sustainability and so forth. But we really can't get the American people's attention other than those who come to our symposia and understand the nature of the problem. When you say, okay, let's go talk to the congressman, let's go talk to the senator. They don't even hear, it, it's, it's uh, politically impossible. We couldn't do it.
the Roman Republic fell in part because the citizens stopped serving as the army. And a professional army, largely German, was recruited, and not volunteers necessarily, uh, but disconnected from the populace and their sense of civic duty. Um, and we're in the danger, we have a danger of doing something similar. We have a question over here. Oh, um, we jumped talking in Congress, this is a very risk averse group of people, not risk averse to get into wars, but risk averse to not go with the flow, with the crowd. So your foreign policy is obviously spot on, but we're a political body. And so how do you talk to these people in such a way that they, as a staff, can barely get them to do something that's so trivial to go outside the mainstream, that it's almost so trivial that nobody cares. So how do you get them to do something that is so outside of what's the accepted wisdom to uh, do the sorts of things you're talking about? Two points. Larry will have <laughs> other things to say. First, uh, most of the polling data supports restraint in foreign policy and is anti-interventionist. And candidate Trump tapped into that in the last election. So the sentiment is out there uh, to be organized. Second, there is nothing to prevent a senator or a member of Congress from going out and defending the Constitution. It's not, doing that is something that is pretty hard to assail. Third, you can, if you're a member of Congress, take a position, or in the Senate, take a position on specific wars. It makes sense, it doesn't make sense. I would like to see the objectives defined. How are we gonna end this? Those are questions that attract positive attention. So I don't agree with the cowardice that I see up here. I don't think it's politically necessary. I've got the, a very specific experience over the last two months with uh, House Continuing Resolution 81 and uh, Senate Resolution 54 trying to get us out of that brutal war in Yemen, at least out of the support for the Saudis. Um, and it's been torturous. I've had senators look back at me and say, this is a niche issue. And I've said, man, a niche issue? The greatest humanitarian disaster since World War II? People dying of cholera, women and children being bombed, Raytheon bombs in the middle of the aftermath? Uh, come on, this is not a niche issue. This is serious stuff. This is a war power. Oh, and then we talk a little bit. And you saw the vote we got in the Senate probably, uh, 54 to 44, something like that. Uh, we're making some progress, maybe, but it's tough. Time for just one more question. <clears throat> sure. Both of you have mentioned uh, intelligence manipulation as leading to the Iraq War and um, potentially some things going on right now or more recently. Uh, what are some of the things that members of Congress and their staff should be on the lookout for? And uh, what are the kinds of questions that they should be asking? Because after all, they have the ability to haul in all sorts of people from the executive branch and get private briefings and ask tough questions. So what should they be looking for? Let's be honest. We have memoranda reports coming out of the Intelligence Committee that are political documents, not intelligence documents, not evaluations, not objective. No credibility. Um, and the second point I'd like to make is that, you know, with all of the talk about the deep state and so forth, uh, there are a lot of people with a lot of integrity in the intelligence community uh, who do serious work of analysis and who don't follow the political directives that they sense are being sent their way and reach independent conclusions. Uh, but when you see uh, politicians purporting to make intelligence judgments and nobody from the intelligence community joining them in saying the things they're saying, you should be wary. Um, and I think Larry mentioned uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's performance the other day. Uh, he's not the only one who's doing this. Well, I, I agree with the comments that Chaz just made. I think the two most important developments 
and all of my students' research over the last 14 years supports this too, with regard to an out-of-control intelligence apparatus, whether it's the CIA, the DIA, or whatever, was the formation after the famous Church and Pike hearings of the two oversight committees. <coughs> Unfortunately, those two committees have become cheerleaders for the intelligence committee, whether it's Feinstein or Burr. Right. It doesn't make any difference. They're cheerleaders for the intelligence committee. They're supposed to be oversight committees. They're supposed to be like Harry Truman during the uh, profligate days of the warmongers during uh, Germany before we got into World War II and Harry ran the investigating committee that just tore into people who were corrupting the country and corporate practices with regard to selling to anybody and everybody. We need those kinds of committees. We need strong, powerful people on those committees. We need bipartisanship on those committees. We need them going after the bad guys. And importantly, we need them supporting the people that I think are the preponderant number of people that Ambassador Freeman just mentioned who are high quality analysts, honest, courageous people who flock out of the agencies and the different departments when they find people like the current candidate for CIA director being rewarded. They don't, they don't want to have anything to do with a government agency that is going to reward those kind of people and ultimately punish them because they're truth tellers, or at least they're fact tellers. They give the picture that they want to give. This started big time in the post-World War II era with Russia. It started with Casey when he was the CIA director for Ronald Reagan. And Casey built a picture to support Ronald Reagan's arms build up. Whether Reagan knew about it or not, I have no idea. I don't think anybody will ever know. His biographers certainly don't know. But Casey built a picture of the Soviet Union that was opposite of what was happening in the Soviet Union, the results of which we would see in 1989 and 90. It was falling apart. Economically, particularly, it was falling apart. But that didn't get to the people who were making decisions. What got to them was a 10-foot bear that was, you know, as enormous as ever, and that supported the arms buildup and so forth. So we've got a sort of an institutional history of the leadership, not the guys in the bowels, not the men and women really doing the work, politicizing intelligence. It's not just the policymakers, it's the George Tenets and the John McLaughlins who do it too, uh, for various and sundry reasons. But those two committees could check that at least. That's what our founders thought this apparatus was set up for, you know, oversight and so forth. I think that's the two, those two committees missing from this process is serious stuff. Very serious. And that will bring our program to a close. And please help me in thanking our panelists. Thank you for coming.